Let, let's do it in English for, for the speaker as well. He's going to raise his hand as well. How many of you are using a phone that's not with Android or iOS? Uh -huh. I'm kind of. I have a few of them. Not really in my pocket, but I have them. Well, and you have them in. All right. Заповядайте, моля, вземете вашите места, след малко започваме. Uh, while, we're, while we're waiting, let's ask the, the audience uh, what kind of um, phone are they using? Uh, like this random guy here, what, what is your phone? Hey, what's up? I use Android, but I have a Librem 5 uh, Firefox OS phones. What? Oh, that's so strange. Well done. What, what, what? Oh, no, not about you. Let me ask someone else, someone random guy like this guy here. What do you use? Xperia XA2 with Selfish OS and uh, N900 with Milo. Oh, nice. Wow. Is, is there anyone uh, using anything else? Like, I think I've heard about something about Android. It's a new thing, you know? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Uh, I know it's an early morning, and it's a uh, second day, so it's really hard to get up and be here on time, and uh, we highly appreciate that you do. So maybe 15 years ago, there were some phones that had hardware keyboards. Uh, they were running Linux, <laughs> like Debian distributions. Uh, do you remember these times? How many of you? All right, pretty much all of us. And now we have here Merlin, who's coming from the Netherlands, and he's working on a port, modern port, for these devices, but not only the old devices, also some of the new devices. So please, a round of applause for what he's doing and the speech that he's going to deliver now. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, like you said, it's not, I know it's early, but uh, I think we'll have a lot of fun. Um, so this talk will be uh, two parts. First, I'll talk about what Mamo Lasty is and uh, why we're doing it. Uh, that will be about 10 minutes, I think. And then the rest of it will be the more uh, deep dive into what runs on the phone, how does it work, which parts of Linux do we use, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so first, also a bit about me, I guess. Um, yeah. So I'm Merlin Weyer. Um, I'm from Amsterdam, as you said. I've been uh, part of the Amsterdam hackerspace for a very long time. I don't go there much anymore because I'm almost never in Amsterdam anymore. Uh, but I still, uh, I'm a very active member of the Sofia hackerspace. I don't remember exactly when I came first to Bulgaria. I think it was 2012 or something. So I've been coming here for quite a while. Um, my day job, or actually my job because uh, it's a different time zone, is for the Internet Archive. They are uh, archive.org, you might know from the Wayback Machine or, or book digitization, that kind of stuff. And uh, Memo is a very serious hobby, so it's not a, a full-time job or anything, but uh, it takes up most of the spare time that I, that I have. Um, okay, so what is Memo Lester? Uh, we started the project in 2017. Um, it's been going on for, you can say there was a preparation to get this project going for much longer. Uh, but this is when we officially started, and I think we made our first public post in 2018. And it is a phone OS that runs uh, Debian, or Dev1 in our case, but it's, it's basically the same thing. So I have one here. Uh, I was calling someone earlier today, I guess. And uh, it's really like uh, you take a laptop, you install Debian, and you have everything here. App get install Firefox, you have Firefox. App get install Thunderbird, you have Thunderbird. You won't have a good time using Thunderbird without a keyboard on a very small screen, but you can do it. Uh, and there's a lot more packages that are much more useful. If you want to run an HTTP server on your phone, you can do it. Um, so it doesn't just work on phones, it also works on tablets. Um, I think we might have a tablet that we can show off. We have, okay, good, <laughs> uh, later at the stand, because we also have a stand uh, somewhere here. Um, and the other cool thing, I think, is that uh, all, all our Memo packages are just a repository that you add. So you can install Dev1 on your laptop, and then you add our key for our packages, and you add our packages line, and you should be almost good to go. I'm saying almost because we have a few tweaks that we make to some configuration files that might not be in the repository fully. But uh, generally, that's how it works. So it really is just Debian. We didn't fork Debian. We didn't fork Dev1. It's you just Debian. You get the updates from Debian. Um, 
And we currently have a very pure stance towards uh, what we support and how we support it. So we support, we don't support, uh, quote, the vendor kernels, unquote, uh, which means that if you buy your phone from, say, Samsung, they give you a specific Linux kernel, which is what interacts with the hardware. And they will update it once or twice, but they don't really care because they're making new phones. And uh, they might give you a security update if they really have to. And we uh, don't do it that way. We've worked with many people, and other people have worked on it for us, on getting drivers for, for, for these kind of phones in the uh, official Linux. So if you go to kernel.org, you can build a kernel that runs on this phone. There's still one or two pieces missing, but basically everything otherwise should work. So that's really cool. And every time we, uh, a new Linux kernel is released, we will use it. So you get uh, infinite security updates, new features, all that stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it should give you a real Linux experience, which means uh, user freedom, hackable, and uh, probably also uh, some debugging that might be required in some cases. Um, and when I did a talk here, I think before COVID, when we announced the project uh, at OpenFest, uh, I was saying that we were very much in alpha stage, and <laughs> I'm happy to say that we're nearing the beta stage. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't say that we're quite in beta yet, where everyone can just use it very easily. Um, and since this year, we have a, an official association here in Bulgaria. So uh, we have a legal entity and uh, all of that that comes with it. So we have um, some funding in the past that we saved up, and we have it in the association. So we're trying to find ways to get more people involved, maybe even pay some people to work on the, on the project. Um, and then the name might be a bit confusing. So MIMO is the, the original Nokia project that we've based ourselves on. So we have taken uh, all their open source stuff and made it uh, more modern, made it use new, new modern libraries. And the closer stuff we re-implemented, I would say mostly <laughs> Evilo re-implemented. <laughs> and um, uh, so, so we're, we're still very much the MAMO project. And then last is the name of a wind. So every MAMO project that Nokia did before had the name of a wind. So there was Fermental, Diablo, and, and others like that. So that's why we, we came up with this name. We picked it very early, and we just uh, stuck to it. Um, yeah, so I think this wasn't the first memo on the N900 that we based ourselves on. There were others for in the previous internet tablets that Nokia had, the uh, N800, N810, and the N770. You might remember some of them. Um, they were at the time very novel and cool. Now they're very old and, and ancient. Um, but Nokia did something similar. They used Debian, but they made their own Debian fork. So they didn't get anything back from Debian, and there was no way to get updates in there. Uh, and only some parts were open source. Uh, there was a community effort that uh, did reverse engineer some of the code and make it open source, and they provided updates to other ways, which is really cool. And we've used a lot of their work as well in Memo Lesta because it was open source and it was exactly what we needed. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was our main idea. We, we build on Memo Fermento from Nokia N900 because we think they got a lot of things right. And even though it was you know, uh, from quite a while back, we think we did, they did a pretty good job of defining what the uh, location APIs look like, how your phone should act when you actually get called, what the phone should do when you hold it close to your ear, right? all these things. Um, so we try to stick very much to their uh, APIs. And if we re-implement something, we try to support the same API, whether it is over a, a D-Bus or a, a library call, because there were a lot of extra packages that the community provided for the N900 MAMO, MAMO for Mantle. And that way, we can just take the old packages, uh, compile them, fix a couple of compile errors, and it works. And you can see this on, the, on our stand. We have uh, probably quite a few applications you know from the old MAMO times, uh, like a Maps application that has, runs GPS and everything. You can just use it. And we had to make very little changes for that. Uh, So why why Memo Lesta? I think this is a big question. I think for some of us, some of us it might just be that we really like the Nokia 900, the the phone I still have here, but, uh, the original one, the old one, and uh, I still use the Nokia phone today. Uh, I also use Memo Lesta phones, but I also use the original Nokia OS, um, and we really liked it, and we didn't want to give it up. We didn't like what Android and uh, Apple did, so we just decided to make our own. Uh, but there are other reasons. For example, uh, I personally think that the whole duopoly of Apple and Android controlling the entire market together is very unhealthy. It's not good for users because they cannot pick anything else. And Android and iOS, they do mostly the same things. Uh, a lot of the applications, they send a lot of your data. 
uh, you get a lot of ads in, in random applications. You can't really decide not to send your data. Try, try to use a, a normal Google phone without making a Google account, without sending all your stuff to Google. It's, it's very hard to do. Right? So, and, and we don't want that uh, if we navigate into traffic that Google knows where we are every 10 seconds because they, that's how they measure how busy the traffic is, right? Because they know where all the other Google phones are. Um, so a very big thing is uh, privacy and security. Um, but also, also, like I was trying to say before, uh, for, for businesses, this is, also, this is also a problem because if you want to make an application, you have to abide to Android and iOS's rules. And if they want you to pay 20% of everything you make to them because they make a phone platform, then you'll just have to do it or you have to sue them and you're probably losing court. Um, so it's, it's, I think, pretty unhealthy to, get, have a, a lot of good, uh, to not have a good competition there, uh, much like Windows in the, in the early years of the computers. Um, and we, we wanted an open platform, real Linux. So on Android is technically running Linux, but there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't call Linux, or at least not uh, GNU slash Linux, which is all the familiar stuff that you know from your, from your phone, or you know, just to be able to open a terminal and type Python and get the working Python binary, or, or be able to install a package without going through a lot of hoops. That's what I call uh, real Linux. And we are entirely community developed. We did get some European funding several times to um, uh, work on the project, but uh, there's no company behind it. Well, I guess we have an association now, but it's an association in the uh, public uh, interest, so there's no, we don't, we're not allowed to even sell anything. We can only do things for the public good. Uh, I should mention some other projects. There is uh, UB Ports, so other projects that are doing something similar to what we're doing. Uh, UB Ports is um, a continuation of what Ubuntu was trying to do with Ubuntu Phone, or Ubuntu Touch, I think they called it. And UB Ports is a, is a variant of that. Um, it's interesting, but I think they, they are based on Ubuntu, but they just ship an image to your phone, and you cannot just install new applications with AppGet. I think you, you have to flash new images for a new update, so it's a bit, a bit different from what we're doing. Uh, Postmarket OS is very cool. They have... Um, a lot of devices that they kind of support uh, through various means, so not just through the mainline Linux kernel approach that I said earlier, where you go to kernel.org and you build your own kernel, but they also uh, just want uh, to bring life to older devices that are not supported by the vendors anymore. So if you have an old Android phone, there's a chance that it works with Postmarket OS because they use the old Android kernel and then put uh, modern Linux on top of it. <coughs> uh, Mobian is relatively new. I think it came around with the, with the Pine phone, and it's uh, the Purism mobile OS uh, running on Debian. So that's actually probably the most similar to what, what we're doing. Uh, but they, I think they require a, a bit more resources. Uh, but it's an interesting project to check out as well. Uh, yeah, and most of all, it's uh, fun, for us at least, and hopefully also for people to use, or just to get at least a, a retro experience to see Memo again many years later. Uh, all right, so like I said, we have a stand, and I think I'll go there after the talk because I think there's a speaker's room, but we, we can just talk at the stand if you have any questions. Um, currently on this phone, which is a Motorola phone running MemoLess, I have about two days of battery life uh, when just having it in my pocket and using it sometimes, which is, uh, for me, pretty good. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Uh, it used to be five, six hours, and some of the phones are still pretty bad, but one to two days is great. If people want to call me, it just, it just works. Um, and for several devices, the phone calls work just great. So again, with the phone I just held up, you can call people, text people, and it's uh, pretty reliable, and it just works. And the phone audio quality is pretty good. Uh, but the user experience is definitely still lacking. So something that, for example, currently is missing is if people call me, there's no notification that they called me. We have a development branch where it does show notifications, but that's not uh, on this phone yet. Um, otherwise, I think the experience on our supported device is very smooth. The 3D graphics now are working really well. And um, yeah, I've, I've shown it to some people the other day and like, whoa, this is really fast for a phone 10 years old. And uh, it's true, we, we use like maybe 200 megabytes of RAM for most of what we on, runs on the phone, and that's, uh, that's it. And if you take a modern Android phone, you need three or four gigabytes of RAM. Of course, that's not necessarily Google's fault. There's a lot of applications that use a lot of RAM. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that. And we have all the basics. So uh, email works. I email every day for my, for my device. We have uh, a plethora of browsers available, none that we have sanctioned as our browser, but you can, you can try the different ones, Chromium, Firefox. There's more mobile-oriented ones. There's the low-resource Dillo. Um, 
Of course, we have thermal emulators. There's a calendar and contacts that work uh, very well now. I have them synchronized to my uh, next cloud at home, and then they synchronize to my other Nokia phones. Uh, and that, that, that's all just working fine. Uh, mobile data works. And uh, I wake every day up every day with the alarm of my main molester phone. So it's, uh, it's been proven to be pretty reliable. The main thing, and I, I think uh, one of the big focuses now, is, is the real-time communication frameworks. Um, we have something in the works to do uh, XMPP chat, SMS, but uh, it needs some more work to be, be, be really usable. So hopefully that will come in the next month and a half. Uh, finally, uh, what are the currently supported devices? The Nokia 900, obviously. Uh, it's also the least powerful one of the whole list. The Motorola Droid 4, which you can see at the stand. I don't have it with me now. Uh, the Motorola Bionic that I was showing, uh, the Pine Phone, which is, I think, the most recently manufactured uh, device of all of these. It's uh, made by Pine64. Uh, and we actually support it reasonably well now. Um, it doesn't have a keyboard by default, but you can buy a keyboard add-on, which um, makes it more usable. Uh, but the battery life is not that great on the Pine Phone, unfortunately, which is, uh, I think, more of a hardware problem than, uh, uh, than a software problem. Uh, and then for development, we have virtual machines. So you can run uh, virtual machine on your laptop because we also support the Intel architecture, so then you can do all your testing on a virtual machine and then uh, build it in our, in our CI to get, get it to the devices. Uh, the Olimix Lime 2, uh, various all-winner tablets, and the Raspberry Pi are also supported, uh, and you can show, see it at the stand, so if you want to develop with one of these devices, it's, it's pretty simple. <coughs> and in the future, um, probably we should be able to reasonably easily support the Nokia N9, the Droid 3, maybe the Droid 2 and 1, but they're also pretty old, so it might not be worth it. Uh, the Motorola Razr devices and the uh, Motorola Atrix 2 devices, they are all very similar to the Droid and the Bionic. Um, so I, I'm having, I, I ordered some, so hopefully within the next uh, half a year we'll get more of them to work. And uh, then there's the question of newer devices. There are some that we are looking at, like the FX Tech phone, and there's um, some other phones by uh, a Chinese company that we're looking at to support. Uh, but that, that's about it. Maybe when the uh, phone is completely usable, so I, I use them every day, but I wouldn't feel super comfortable to tell normal people, yeah, that's right, this works fine, no problem. Right, because I do run into problems. If I don't run into big problems anymore, then I think we uh, could consider that our user space, so everything that runs uh, outside of Linux, is stable enough and featureful enough that we can maybe look at supporting many more devices. But if our focus now is just to support more devices, then if people have a decent experience on our phones, then they'll have a decent experience on our phones. But I would like them to have a good experience on our current phones, and then we'll look at supporting more devices. And maybe we'll do it like PostMarketOS does with LibHybris if the community supports that. But uh, currently, that's not, not, uh, not in our plans because we're still working on other things. Uh, all right, so I'm going to look at 10 different so-called domains of uh, the MAMO architecture. And you can actually find all of these on the old Nokia wiki. They have a, a diagram with how they envisioned that it should work. And I, I kind of stuck to that. And I will discuss all the different um, <coughs> demons and user space programs that run there and how they interact. So first, the uh, core domain. Um, obviously, all our devices run the Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel deals with all the hardware setup power management, when to enable the vibration motor, how to talk with the vibration motor, how to talk with the audio driver, how to talk with the modem. All that stuff is drivers in Linux. And if you don't have the driver, then the, the phone is useless, right? So this is a very important part. And then uh, we have various bootloaders. On some devices, we use U-Boot. Uh, on other devices, we use KXEC boot, and this warrants some explanation. So, <coughs> for example, on the Nokia N100, we use U-Boot, and U-Boot is a uh, bootloader project. And what the bootloader really does is initialize the hardware on a basic level, load Linux, and then let Linux handle everything else. Uh, in, on your laptop, you might know it as Grub or uh, ISO Linux or something like this. Um, but on ARM devices, there's tip, there is Grub, but we don't, we don't use it. Uh, and so you would set up the display, let you click, select what OS you want to load, and, and then it loads that from the SD card or something like that. Uh, in other cases, we use KXEC boot, which is more involved. Um, the name comes from a system call on Linux, which is called KXEC, which allows uh, the Linux kernel to load, to stop, and load another Linux kernel. 
And I think the original idea was that it would allow for uh, almost no down downtime when you're upgrading a server. So if there's a big security flaw in Linux, you load the new Linux kernel on the old one and you continue with what you were doing instead of rebooting and having the whole memory check of the server run for five, 10 minutes. Anyway, uh, as it turns out, many of the Android phones, they support kexec boot. And the problem is that some of the phones, they are, uh, they have a locked bootloader, which means that the company decides that you cannot run anything else on their stuff because they signed it or they don't give away uh, to interact with the phone and load your own things. So um, usually Android phones get rooted, just like this one. And what we ended up doing is uh, we rooted the device, we figured out, uh, I mean, this is partially worked on the work of other people, but this is what Kaxic Boot does. We figured out how to load something in the boot process, and the bootloader then already is running Linux. So the bootloader of the phone already starts the, let's say, Samsung Linux or Motorola Linux. But then we have a shell, and then we use the KXX system call to load our own kernel. So we're basically using the upgrade mechanism to, to unlock the bootloader and load whatever we want to load, uh, which is actually a real hassle, but it works. And it would be much better if they just uh, allowed you to load whatever you want. Um, and then the other core is uh, the window manager, the whole display system, uh, X11. You might have heard of it. It's uh, very old, and up until recently, all Linux laptops run X11. Um, now some of them run Wayland, which is, I think, the successor to many people to X11. And actually, I found that a lot of people were surprised that we run X11. They thought it was some embedded thing. And, but actually, X11 is uh, what we use, and that means that whatever applications use X11, they work, which is most of what's in Debian. So again, you can install whatever you want, and it will at least start, and hopefully you can use it. We've used Pux Paint the other day, games, they should typically just start. Uh, and X11 interacts with the DRM and input subsystems of Linux, so DRM is the direct rendering manager, and that deals with how uh, to talk with the graphics card, how to set up the displays, uh, and the input layer, obviously, for keyboard, touchscreen input, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, we're based on uh, Debian and Dev1, and uh, apt and dpkg are the, the, the package manager interfaces to Debian, and uh, those are just available. And we use all the standard, again, standard Debian utils, so core utils from GNU, which is LS, bin, and uh, we have bash. We also have BusyBox available, but I don't think it's used as the core part of the system, whereas uh, Nokia, they actually use BusyBox, which is a more minimal implementation of uh, all the, the standard Unix tools, uh, and it's smaller, so it made sense for them, but I, I think we decided to just use core utils because it works just the same and it's actually faster. Um, and of course, all the modern TLS libraries and everything else is, is available, OpenSSL, TLS, all the crypto is just there. Okay, this is the big slide. <laughs> so this is what runs in the, in the, in the, system, the system layer. Um, we use the OpenRC init system. I'm not sure, does that ring a bell to anyone here, OpenRC? Okay, a couple. So... Um, uh, let's say five, six years ago, most laptops run only one init system, which is the program that starts all the other programs. And it was very arcane, but it worked quite well. Uh, then came along another project from, from Red Hat called System D, which was a, a rewrite of the whole program in C, and it's uh, very fast. But it, um, it's much harder to change, in my opinion. And then OpenRC is another thing like System D, but it's uh, written in shell and, and, more, and, and C and more easily to change. Uh, so we use OpenRC, which is in, in Dev1, and that's actually the main, one of the main reasons we use Dev1, because Debian doesn't support OpenRC anymore. They only support Systemd. Um, so OpenRC is the program that starts everything else on Memo. So when Linux starts, it starts OpenRC, and OpenRC starts everything else. Uh, then there's a program that we inherited from the original Memo, which is DSME. That stands for Device State Management Entity. That's a, a mouthful, but basically it's there to deal with... Um, some urgent things. For example, if um, a service crashes that we really need, it will just restart the phone. For example, if it's no longer possible to make phones, a phone calls, it will, it will restart the phone. But if uh, a service crashes, it will restart it if it's not essential, right? Because you don't want to end up with a phone where you cannot make an emergency call. So then what do you do? So DSME takes part of some of this. It also starts uh, and restarts other demons, which is, it kind of works together with OpenRC in that way. Um, but DSME also manages the shutdown. So OpenRC hands off some of the work to the uh, Nokia DSME. Then core to pretty much everything that we do is, is, is Dbus, 
which is a method, method to, for processes on the system to communicate together or to expose certain functionality. And you'll find Dbus everywhere. It's on, on, on all your laptops. It's uh, basically what everyone uses on Linux. So if you want to talk to the modem, there's a Dbus extraction for talking to the modem. And then you can just say, OK, this modem, power it on. And that's like a one-liner uh, from your shell. Or if you want to have a notification sense, it's a kind of one-liner using Dbus. So Dbus is a way for the program that sends notifications or the program that talks to the modem uh, to talk with you or you to talk with them. Um, so this is basically all the other demons, if I'm correct. Probably all of them use Dbus. Everything down, this, down in this list uh, uses Dbus to talk with some of the systems. Another core uh, daemon is MCE, which is the mode control entity. Uh, there's not enough space to fit the, <laughs> the whole word there, but basically it interacts with many, many things. It does a lot. Uh, for example, um, it reads the industrial I.O. It uses the industrial I.O. subsystem on Linux to figure out, is my phone oriented like this? Is it like this? Am I shaking it? Is it face down? Is it face up? Uh, am I holding it close to my ear? Because there's a proximity sensor in the phone, so then it knows to turn off the screen, because if you t start touching the <laughs> touch screen with your ear, you might accidentally hang up. Um, there's a light sensor, for example. If I'm in a bright room and I turn on my screen, it will probably dim the light a bit because there's a lot of ambient light. But if it's very dark, it will know that it needs to make the screen a bit brighter. Um, it also interacts with the input system. For example, if I use this slider or this button, then it will turn on the screen. So it needs to know, OK, is the power button pressed? Is some slider pressed? Are the volume keys pressed as well? Um, or uh, so for example, even just to wake up the screen, it needs to know what you're doing. So. Um, you expect your phone's display to turn off at some point, right? If you don't touch it for a while, it'll probably turn off unless you tell it to do otherwise. But if you touch it again on Memo, then um, MCE registers that you're using the touchscreen, and then it turns on the display again. So like I said, it also manages the display. It uses DRM, and it talks to X11 to achieve all of this. Uh, another core part is Ophono, which is the modem abstraction layer. So um, most of the modems the current ones and all the old ones should talk to them using AT, which is a very arcane uh, protocol. <laughs> um, and they all talk a slightly different version of AT. And they also sometimes have a USB interface. And what Ophono does, it abstracts um, the complexity of dealing with a modem. So you can imagine if you support 10 different phones, but they all have a different way to talk to the modem, then you don't want your program that uh, starts a phone call when you press the button call to know how to talk with all the different modems. So Ophono is the abstraction for all of this. So if Ophono supports all these 10 phones, then you can just tell Ophono, OK, call this number. And then it says, OK, we're calling it. Um, we had to do a lot of work on this on, our, uh, on the phones that we currently support, because uh, many of them were not supported at all. And recently, the support got really well, uh, got really good. And I, I use it every day now, and it's, it's, uh, it's been good. Um, Upower is. Uh, not something that we wrote. And to be clear, Ophono is also a big project outside of our control, but we contribute patches to it. So it's been maintained by others. Um, uh, the same is true for Upower. It's a free desktop project. And it's, a, again, a Dbus interface around uh, batteries. Or if you want to know if you're plugged into power, Upower will tell you. If you want to know how much capacity you have in your battery, Upower will tell you. If you want to know what the average power drain is over the last five minutes, Upower will tell you. So we have a battery applet that talks with you, Power over Dbus, to show uh, what is going on on the phone. And then there's another project that we, uh, it's also not ours, but it's also a free desktop application, uh, IO, IIO Sensor Proxy. And it is a, and again, an abstraction layer. So many of these things are abstraction layers to the uh, sensors of Linux. So again, as I mentioned, the proximity sensor is close to your ear. The, accelerometer, how much, how much is your phone moving, the, the light sensor, these are all industrial I.O. Uh, sensors. And to talk with them, you have to use a low-level Linux API, or you use Dbus to talk with I.O. sensor proxy. So again, we, MCE, for example, MCE talks to I.O. sensor proxy, and it uses its API to figure out what, what, what to deal with. Um, in some cases, some of the sensors are also exposed using the input uh, subsystem of Linux, which is a bit weird, but for example, you can imagine that, um, I'm not sure if this was true for the proximity sensor, but it was for some others, that if you hold it here, the input will say, okay, now the 
proximity close to your ear button is on. <laughs> Uh, but they're moving away from that, so everything is moving to I.O. sensor proxy and, and, and not the uh, input uh, system. Uh, then Alarm D is another um, uh, daemon that manages alarms in MAML, so it's just it's our project. Um, it sounds pretty simple, but um, it has some nice features, at least on the uh, Nokia 900 that we plan to implement in other places as well, which is um, it can wake up the phone. So if you set an alarm for 9 in the morning, but you have a low battery, you can turn off your phone and leave it next to your bed. And then at 9 in the morning, the phone will start up. And it will know that it started up because there's an alarm going. And then it will show off the alarm, and you can press snooze or, or stop. And then the phone will turn off again. Right? So this is um, not, not something that's supported on all the devices, uh, but it's something that I'm not even sure that works in most Android phones today. Uh, but it's a feature I really, really like personally, so the, the daemon knows how to interact with the lower level hardware to have the phone wake up on a certain time, because most phones they have a real-time clock, and you can have the real-time clock wake up the device. Of course, if your device doesn't support it in the hardware, then there's nothing we can do. Um, then another one is uh, IP, IPHDB, which stands for IP Heartbeat. I think I even mistyped it. Yeah, it's IPHBD, so IP Heartbeat uh, Daemon. Um, and this is used to save power on the device. So um, if you have many programs running at once and they all use the internet, they will use it at different times, right? So it'll be like this. But if you can synchronize when they use the internet, so they all use it at the same time, you can conserve power that way. So IPHBD is uh, an interface that applications can optionally support to, to save power. Um, and we've integrated this, I think, only last week. And um, it's been saving power. There's a Profile D, which is, uh, again, a MAMO project, but it's also been used elsewhere, but it's in our repositories, which is uh, um, used for uh, profiles. So if you want a silent profile, you want your phone not to vibrate, it will, it will deal with those things. Um, there's Clock D, which I'm actually not sure of how much it does, um, but I think it's used to send signals to various parts of the phone when you decide to change the time or change the time zone. And finally, there's MAMO Launcher, which is a uh, user space program that we use to more quickly start programs. So uh, it preloads various big libraries like GTK or Qt, and then it forks off itself. And it's, uh, in that way, it allows you to more quickly start up because it doesn't have to um, load the whole program. So if you load a program in Linux, it's very complicated. It has to resolve uh, library names and linking. And if you do some of that before, it saves some time. It was maybe more relevant 15 years ago, but uh, we still use it today, and I think it still helps some. OK, and then there's the connectivity domain. Uh, the other domains aren't quite as big as this one, don't worry, <laughs> or as the, as the previous one. Um, so WPA Supplicant is the program that interfaces with Wi-Fi, and you'll probably know it from, from your laptop, or maybe you don't know you have it, but you probably use it on your laptop. Uh, and it uh, interfaces with these, uh, the config uh, 80221 subsystems and the, the physical layer of the Linux uh, subsystems. And it basically manages everything for your Wi-Fi, uh, if you're connected to Wi-Fi or not, what uh, kind of Wi-Fi you're connected to, the encryption of your Wi-Fi, if you got the password wrong or right, if you got uh, dropped from the network, all that stuff, it, it deals with that for you. And again, it exposes it over the bus. Um, Cellular D is something that we came up recently because we needed something to manage the modem state. Uh, Ophono is very helpful in providing an abstraction, but if no, nothing actually says, okay, let's turn on the modem, then you need some program to maybe turn on the modem at some point, but it's better to have something consistent that manages that, and if you go into flight mode, it will turn off the modem. Um, Blue Z is the Bluetooth stack of Linux, and uh, we use it. ICD2 is our network manager. So it takes care of all the different network connections you can have, uh, USB or wireless or 3G, 4G. Um, this is also in the original MIMO. And this is maybe, maybe not what people would expect because um, the main thing to manage networks on Linux is Network Manager, uh, which is a pretty big project and it's used on most laptops and I think sometimes even on servers now. Uh, but uh, so much of MAMO uses the I, I squared D, uh, I C, pardon, not I squared, I C D to uh, daemon, 
that it made sense for us to uh, use this. So we developed a WPA subsequent module for it. We developed a Ophono module for it. And uh, all of that is working really well now. So again, we just keep the interface and everything else works. Um, then there's various user space and uh, tools and dialogues. So uh, tools to check how many retries you still have on your SIM card. Tools to show a dialogue where you can uh, click, uh, click on Wi-Fi. All that stuff is in, in what we call con UI. Um, and it also contains uh, setting dialogues to, to manage your networks, to change the passwords. All that stuff is implemented in, in con UI. And it was also used in the integration of the, the uh, Tor and WireGuard projects. Uh, how many of you know Tor and WireGuard? Tor or WireGuard? OK, I'll, I'll briefly explain it. So Tor stands for the onion router. And it is a way to anonymize your internet traffic. So if you want to go to a website, but you don't want the website to know who you are or where you are, then you use Tor. There's other things to use, but basically the answer is you use Tor. Um, of course, if you then fill in your name on the website, they will know who you are. But if you only load the website, then they shouldn't know who you are or where you are. Um, and as an aside, I actually run a foundation in the Netherlands that uh, runs Tor exit nodes, so we, we contribute to the network. Uh, and and we, we help with uh, obfuscating packets. Um, we integrated this in Memo because we hold privacy and security very dear. So in Memo, you can just say, OK, enable Tor for everything, and then every program will use Tor. There's a lot more you can do to improve uh, privacy and anonymity, but this is, a, I think, a f first good step. And the same is true for WireGuard. WireGuard is a more general purpose uh, virtual private network, like OpenVPN or I don't know what the Windows ones are called. But basically, you can use it to uh, set up virtual private networks on MAMO even for different Wi-Fi connections. So if you're at the home Wi-Fi, you cannot use the VPN. But if you're at another Wi-Fi, you can use the VPN. And all of this, again, builds on the ConUI framework to have it automatically integrate in, in MAMO. Uh, and we also wrote IC, ICD2 plugins for it. OK. Um, the real-time communication domain is um, mostly consistent out of a project called Telepathy, um, which is a bit of a weird name, but the idea is that you can you know, talk with people using this central framework. Um, and they support various protocols. So they support IRC, XMPP, um, uh, many more. Uh, and they also have an interface for, for phone calls and such. And we uh, on MAMO, MAMO use Telepathy, and we uh, also use it. So it's an abstraction layer for chat applications. And the reason that we use it is that it provides a very good integration. So you can theoretically have Slack, uh, Discord, Telegram, Signal, all this stuff in the same framework. And you can use the same application to talk with all the people, no matter what protocol they're using. So that is what we are, we are aiming for. And the same is true for calls. The calls application uses telepathy. The SMSs in the future will be sent using telepathy. Um, the main problems with this is that it can sometimes be complicated to implement things, and there's a specification that says what you can and cannot do with it, and it hasn't been updated for a while. So if we want to add more sophisticated features, we will have to update the specification and hope that people agree with us. Um, multimedia, we current for, currently for audio, we use the Pulse Audio audio server. We will replace it later with Pipewire which is the up and coming sound server. And it actually has a compatibility layer for Pulse Audio, I believe. Um, but we're not quite at the point yet. Um, the main advantage for Pipewire for me is that it's a bit more clever about what it should do with routing and um, when to use the CPU or not. For example, in Pulse Audio, when I was playing with earlier, I loaded the module to do echo cancellation, which is you know to not hear <laughs> yourself back. And uh, it used CPU all the time. So when I went to bed, my phone had only 10% battery left in the morning because it was constantly doing echo cancellation. And maybe there's a way around it. Uh, but Pipewire seems to be more clever about this. Uh, GStreamer is a general framework for multimedia. It's uh, not ours, but we use it. It's a free desktop uh, project. We use the relatively new lip camera on the Pine phone to uh, interface with the camera. And we will probably start using it on the other phones when they actually start supporting using a camera. Uh, and and a, uh, a media application framework is something from MAMO. Um, all right. And then the location domain. Uh, so if you want to know where you are, if you want to use GPS, we use GPSD, which is not something that uh, Nokia's MAMO is using, but we use it. It's the standard uh, thing to interface with GPS. 
devices, again, it's an abstraction layer around the various ways to talk with GPS applications. And then our own um, projects are Location Daemon, which is um, a better dbus interface to location and more memo aware, and then lip location is the library that applications can use to say, okay, I actually want to use GPS, so please turn GPS on if it wasn't on yet. Uh, in the future, we will probably use GeoClue, which is a, a GPS program used by many of the other distributions. Not necessarily phone, but in general, uh, GeoClue does uh, some other clever things, like based on your IP, it can tell you approximately where you are, this kind of stuff, which we don't currently have. Um, then the toolkits, we use GTK2 mostly for all our stuff. GTK2 is pretty old, um, but it works really well for our purposes still. We have a Qt5 port because Nokia had the Qt4 port and we ported that to Qt5, which is a almost complete port. Many of the applications that you can see on the stand are Qt. Um, we're working on GTK3, but there's still some parts missing there. Um, SDL, the... Uh, What's the best way to describe it? Like, it's used for games a lot. It's, um, we, we support that, and we use gconf and gsettings for managing all the user settings. So if you want to know if your phone was in flight mode or not, or if it was what the normal brightness setting is, or what network you would like to connect to first, that's all stored in gconf. Um, and the rest of the world is moving away from gconf, so we will move with them to uh, gsettings, which is mostly the same thing, but decided that it's better now. Uh, I cannot tell you why, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and then the core things that manage the desktop experience on MIMO are Hilda on desktop, which is the X11 window manager. So that's the thing that places windows in certain places and knows uh, what the size of the window is. It gives them a title bar. All that stuff is done by Hilda on desktop. And again, this was made by Nokia, but we've kept improving it. Um, and this is also the application launcher and, and all that stuff that's all on Hilda on desktop. Then Hilda on home and its applets are things that you see on the desktop. So there can be a calendar applet, or uh, an IP address applet, or you can change the themes by clicking on the desktop and then setting different backgrounds. All that stuff is Hilton Home, and, and there's some more in there as well. Uh, there's the Hilton status menu and applets. This is probably what you would think of an Android as when you swipe down, you see like, you can turn off Wi-Fi, and, and you can turn on Wi-Fi, you can do some things there. That's in our status menu. So for example, turning Tor on and off is there. Connecting to Wi-Fi or 3G is, is there. Seeing the battery status is, is, is in the status applet. Uh, where your location is, is found or not is also in there. Uh, there's the control panel where you can configure all kinds of settings, like how the LED should blink, what Wi-Fi networks you want to connect to, how Tor should work. And then there's uh, Hilton input method, which is the keyboard, virtual keyboard interface that uh, we use all over MEMO. Um, data management. We have the application manager, so it's a user interface to apt or dpkg, much like I think Synapse in the past on Debian, uh, but we have one as well, and it only shows our extra packages, so it doesn't show everything of Debian because then you would have like 22,000 packages to search through, uh, but we could potentially do that later. Um, we have an address book, obviously, and uh, we have a daemon that manages uh, what to do when a USB cable is plugged in. Do you want to share? some directories, do you want to share some storage, do you want to set up a network with your PC, all that stuff. Um, and then there's the application domain. So I, I mentioned most of these before when I was saying what the status is, the clock and alarms, the calendar, email, browser, map applications, navigations, and games. Uh, that's all for the domains. Um, so what is next for our project? Um, domain thing as, like, that is on my mind, but that's not the only thing, is the real-time communication. So we have a chat application that works quite well. You can do XMPP chats with people, but it makes, misses some obvious things, like starting a new conversation with a person you haven't messaged before is not there, um, which is just a matter of a button and some code, but it's not there yet. So there's, there's some obvious problems. Um, we would like to improve the phone application some more so that it's easier to interface with your contacts, or if you're in the contacts address book and you click call, that it actually calls the person automatically. Some of those things are missing. Uh, we'd like to add a lot more protocols. So IRC, XMPP, and SMS are nice, but if many people on the street you will meet, they won't use that. They will use uh, Slack or Signal or WhatsApp or something else. And in some cases, it's really hard to interface with them. Like WhatsApp, they're just very hostile towards other applications. 
but Signal is more open and Matrix is, and those projects are more open, so we'll definitely try to uh, add support for those. And then there's voice and video calls. So XMPP can do voice and video calls, but the, um, there's also normal internet voice over IP calls uh, that we want to support. And you can already do it with an application now, but it's not integrated in the system in the way we would like. Um, the other thing is to improve the GTK, uh, the, the QT5 port, because it lacks some uh, uh, virtual keyboard integration. So sometimes there's an application, and you, if you don't have a keyboard, you press, and you don't get a keyboard. Uh, obviously, that's a problem. Um, we'd like to support some more devices and work on our documentation examples, because our wiki contains a lot of information, a lot of information, but it's not necessarily structured in the best possible way. So we, we plan to use some of our funding, at least, to have people help out with the documentation. Uh, that's it. So uh, this is our web website on GitHub pages. We have a wiki. All the source code is on GitHub. Uh, we have a bug tracker there, and we have an IRC channel. Um, that's about it. The last thing I want to say is the show the resources page. I based some of my information on the original Memo architecture, and I updated it for everything that we use and they don't use or stuff that we don't use from them, but they would use. So everything I listed is, is current for us, but I took inspiration from, from their link. Thank you. <laughs> Be, before, before we continue, I want to like to really thank uh, Ivailo, who is sitting here. He's done so much work on Memo, so if you would, would, wouldn't mind applauding for him as well. <laughs> thank you. Great talk, it's fantastic. And we have a few minutes for some questions. I'm pretty sure there will be interesting questions. Uh, there is a microphone in the middle of the room, so if anyone has a question, can ask. Maybe I can use the opportunity. I have a ton of questions. <laughs> but uh, just the question, one of them is, uh, are you uh, thinking about using Conman for the managing the network connections and the Wi-Fi connections? It's an Intel and Nokia project, after all. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's right there with Network Manager, um, and uh, maybe, but it's not currently high on our list because we have ICD2, and uh, we would definitely benefit some from Network Manager or Conman, but at the same time, all our current applications depend on it. All the past Nokia applications use ICD2. Uh, all our UI is integrated with ICD2, so it's, it would be a pretty big project, but I can see that a couple of years from now we might consider it. But for now, it's a very good fit for our, for our use cases, so not, not currently. Okay. Uh, any questions for the audience? You, we can also talk at the stand. I think that might be a good, good yeah. place to go to. There is so, a stand. Uh, if you haven't visited yet, go there. There are some very cool demonstrations as well. Maybe another question about what's your opinion about Wayland? It seems that it's, what you're doing is very X11 specific. Is Wayland on the roadmap or X Wayland with support for some of the old applications? I think that's definitely something we would like to do at some point. But uh, again, I would say honestly that would be two, three, four years from now if I'm using it every day and, and things are fine and there's more people who like to use it, then we could do it. But uh, many, many things in Memo depend currently on X11, so even how the windows are decorated to, or to have a drop-down menu, those are X11 atoms. So uh, Wayland would need to have something else for that, or we would need to come up with our own alternative way to mark certain windows as, hey, this is a dialogue, or hey, this is something else. Uh, I don't actually know enough about Wayland uh, to tell you how that could work, but uh, eventually we pro probably do that. Fantastic. Let's do another round of applause. And if you want to see the demonstrations, they have a stand. Thank you very much. <laughs>